Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to Day 20 of the McShane Reading Plan. Very glad you could join us today. If you're joining us for the first time, jump in right where we are. If you want to catch up, it's well worth your time, but uh, I would like to invite you to be in the same place as everybody else uh, in our scripture reading, because much like people read books or watch movies or, or TV shows at the same time, or they might catch up later, but watching the current episode or the current episode of the series of films um, consume or watching the same ball games uh, often consumes our conversation and and it's all right to talk about the most recent ball game or TV show um, some I would say some TV shows are most certainly better than others as are movies um, but nonetheless um, how much more <laughs> Uh, of value and of blessing to our souls and our hearts and our minds is uh, uh, being in the same page of the word of our Lord. He, um, he has gifted us his word and it's uh, so good to read it along with you and to talk about it with you. I hope these videos have been a help and a, and a comfort to you and maybe you've learned something uh, along with me. I've learned a lot through reading it last year and I'm learning a lot reading it this year. The Bible is um, thousands of years old and it holds uh, such deep worth because it is the living Word of God and it's never been exhausted yet. Um, it has stood the test of time. So thank you for joining us. I hope it's a blessing to you. Today we are in Genesis 21, Matthew 20, Nehemiah 10, and Acts 20. And a big theme for today, I believe, um, that holds true across all four chapters um, that we have. Uh, whether McShane meant to do this or not, he was a genius, but um, I tend to think that it's just the Spirit of God uh, speaking to the, um, the beautiful connectivity and the con concise and consistent nature of the message of Scripture. I think that plays more into it. Um, so, I, before we begin, I, I really want to give a kind of a humorous uh, tip of the hat to, uh, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, to the patron saint of uh, those who fall asleep in church. And I've been guilty of that, certainly. Uh, haven't fallen asleep in the pulpit yet, but I have certainly fallen asleep in the pew. And my uh, my grandfather uh, Herman Wood used to, uh, was uh, was a deacon, and uh, he himself regularly <laughs> fell asleep, asleep in church. And Grandma had me wake him up. So maybe this has happened to you. It just certainly happened to me. Um, but there's a young man in Acts 20 named Eutychus, and he was sitting in a window while Paul was teaching in the house in a, on a third story, I believe. Yeah, from the third loft. And he was sitting in this open window and he fell asleep during the sermon and he fell three stories to his death. And this goes to show you, yes, the Lord cares and preachers do care about um, those who fall asleep in church. Uh, the Lord allowed Paul to um, pray for this young man and uh, the Lord restored his life to him. Oh. So, just so you know, you fall asleep in church and um, or during a teaching, uh, the Lord knows and cares. It would be better if you stayed awake, certainly, but, um, but that's just a little bit of humor there to begin with. But again, our, our main focus today is the first being last and the last being first. And it goes across um, across our scriptures. Matthew 20 is the is the uh, the main passage from which we get this um, binding tie, the parable of the householder, who gives the same wage to multiple groups of workers, who both start at the very earliest time or mid morning or afternoon or afternoon in the evening or right up until like right before quitting time. And then he pays them in reverse order and he gives them all the same wage, a day's wage. Uh, we might think a penny is a little, is a little um, uh, diminutive, but um, it was considered a day's wage. But he gave the day's wage to everyone. Um, 
this tells us uh, a couple different things. Number one, God is sovereign over how he deals out his blessings. And um, I don't want to uh, wax too uh, far into this, um, into this uh, I guess, concept today, but the fact of the matter is, is who are we to question God? And that's very true. Um, he is the Lord of this universe and beyond. He's the Lord of eternity. And um, he will deal out his blessings and his cursings as he will. Uh, that's a solid fact of scripture. And um, so that's one thing we can gather. Another thing we can gather is that um, seniority has no place in the kingdom or in the church. And what do you mean by seniority? What I mean is it doesn't matter how long you've served the Lord versus somebody else always necessarily. Now, I, I honor people who have been saved a long time and have served the Lord a long time. There's great wisdom to be found there. But it's also important to realize that there are people who are very young believers who God can quickly raise up, quickly raise up and, and have a very effective ministry with them. And uh, we who have been saved a long time, I've been saved the vast majority of my life. Um, if somebody comes along and who has just been saved this year or last year and God raises them up and gives them a mighty ministry. It's, it's not my place to be jealous. It's my place to um, encourage them in what they're doing and uh, lend, my, lend my kindling or my fuel to their fire as, if, as it will um, and pray for them because the, the Lord uses people in his own way and according to his will and according to their talents that he has given them and opportunities that he gives them um, in their spheres of influence. So um, it's my job and your job to rejoice where the Lord is working, even if that person is, is a brand new uh, believer or um, hasn't been around long or maybe hasn't put in the training or time as the rest of us. Um, if uh, it doesn't matter if we've worked all day and they've worked just half the day or even just since quitting time and it might be about quitting time so to speak and, and these days we don't know there's many things that point to that Israel being back in the land and or all the turmoil in the world but who knows how long the Lord will tarry the fact of the matter is is that the first will be last and the last will be first and putting time in is not the soul uh, deciding factor of blessing. Uh, furthermore, um, <laughs> he kind of gives the biggest example and the most potent example of the last being first and the first being last with himself because next he says, uh, we go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed by the chief priest and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him and on the third day shall rise again. So in this way, the first, Jesus Christ, is God. He's absolutely the top of the top, and the first becomes last. He becomes uh, shamed, mocked, beaten, driven into the dirt with the heel of wickedness. And um, then, after he dies, suffers and dies, he is risen from the dead. And he is exalted even more than he ever was. And he was infinitely exalted before. So um, that, that's something that we uh, can't really define mathematically, but it's a, it's a wondrous thing. So the last became, uh, first became last, and from last he became first. Um, the concept of humility and, and the glory of humility is so potent in scripture and it's seen in no clearer terms than in the person of Jesus Christ himself. And interestingly enough, uh, James and John, the sons of thunder, uh, their mom uh, come, comes up and <laughs> after this and requests that James and John become his right and left hand man when he sets up the kingdom on the earth, which wasn't gonna happen right then. And he basically tells her, you know, um, you're going to have to be, if you 
want to anyone who wants to sit on my right and left hand is going to have to endure uh, it's suggested that they are going to have to bear the same cross and that's suffering for his sake um, in whatever capacity comes down comes down the pack whether it's physical suffering emotional or or academic suffering um, social suffering uh, what have you suffering for the sake of Christ and his gospel and his kingdom um, so again if you want to be first you got to be last and those who are seeking solely to be first um, by their own ambition and I, I will say this I think that there are people who may arrogantly seek uh, self-promotion that God can use because the word doesn't return void there are people who have uh, exalted themselves perhaps um, that have still been gifted with the gospel and um, have great learning and great um, uh, great things to offer regarding uh, their uh, academic knowledge in the scripture and God may have really blessed them to expound upon the scripture but uh, God knows their heart and if they've sought to make themselves first um, He's the arbiter of what eternity is going to be. Uh, not, not that they are not saved, but um, there are places and ranks within the kingdom, and uh, we need to be aware of that. Um, so we're going to have to be willing to drink his cup and to be baptized or identified with his identification, not be ashamed of the gospel. <clears throat> but... Um, he says, it's not mine to give, but it's the Father's to give. Uh, the, the Godhead, the triune God, one God, three persons. He, um, he delegates within himself um, what is uh, the authority of one person to the other and vice versa. And uh, then the ten get a, a little bit jealous. And... He expounds to them. He said, hold on, hold on, listen. You know, getting mad and tearing each other down is not going to get it either. Uh, ex exercising dominion over other people. Gentiles, it's worldly to, to pick pecking orders and social orders and cliques. Um, sadly, this is very prevalent in all churches. I, I will see unequivocally all. Anywhere you have people, you will have cliques. Um, and it's not wrong to have close-knit groups of friends but within the kingdom of God it's important to remember um, that we need to um, check ourselves frequently that we are not excluding people who um, don't necessarily fit in with our crowd and I'm not talking about uh, going out and including um, people who are being heretical necessarily but we can reach out to them um, reach out certainly to non-believers that's the very nature of evangelism is reaching out to those who don't at this time belong to our circle um, yes we want to edify ourselves and we want to um, and edify the church uh, but we um, it's to it, the gospel is inclusive in that it reaches out to those who don't belong in love. It is exclusive in that we do not compromise on the truth of Scripture and the truth of who Jesus Christ is, but it is inclusive in that it is for everybody, and we, are want, we should want to seek to include everybody, not all of their baggage and sin, but God calls sinners as they are to come and be redeemed and transformed and uh, within the household of faith it's also important those who are saved that we not um, have pecking orders and uh, uh, get a, get too clicky um, and then another um, instance within Matthew 20 uh, is um, the very at the very last it's Two, there's two blind men while he's going through Jericho, which is the lowest place on earth, the lowest elevated city on earth. It's right near the, the Jordan, down towards the Jordan uh, Valley, going down to um, the Dead Sea. 
it was once brought very low um, by, as you recall, um, by God's hand under the leadership of uh, the Israelites being under the leadership of Joshua. But there's these two blind men that cry out to the son of David for healing. And it's so interesting that these two blind beggars, like so many other individuals within the gospel narrative, these two blind beggars, the lowest of the low, um, recognized who Jesus was, even without having the faculty of sight. And they knew who the son of David was and they cried out to him. They knew what the, what the, um, what the scribes and Pharisees did not. I want to read a quick verse in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 3 and other places in Scripture, but uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians has a lot to say about the foolishness of God versus uh, the, the foolishness of God and the wisdom of man. And um, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he has taken the wise in their own craftiness. And we've talked a lot about this um, in, our, in our reading. We talked a lot about this in our reading. Uh, Abraham was very crafty. Um, he tried to get ahead of God in a lot of ways. And one of, the, one of those ways that was highlighted was getting ahead of God by trying to have a son according to uh, he and Sarah's own ideas rather than according to God's promise by having Ishmael with Hagar. But Abraham here starts to make a turn. I, this is the chapter right after his second uh, bout of lying with a foreign king where he was seeking refuge. And um, Sarah gives birth to Isaac and Isaac's named Laughter. Um, but Ishmael and Hagar are still in the camp. And um, this is not a test to the level of testing that Abraham will, will endure later, but um, it's kind of a beginning that we kind of see him really growing here. And when I first read Genesis 21 this week, I, um, I really, uh, it kind of, I was kind of taken aback at the beginning because I'm like, this is terrible. He's turning Hagar loose at his wife's, because of his wife's bitterness, and he's only giving her a, a bottle of water and a loaf of bread and sending her out into the wilderness. It's like, that's kind of cold-hearted. Here's the thing. This is not, th what Abraham does here is not necessarily within itself to be our example. Uh, turning people loose with uh, little or nothing when it's within our power to show them ki other kindness um, is, I don't think, the example that we're to learn here. The example we're supposed to learn is, number one, Sarah, I, while I don't think Sarah's bitterness, especially since it was her idea in the first place, is to be applauded, but Sarah also understands that Isaac is to be the son of promise, and Abraham knows that too, and she doesn't want there to be uh, strife in the house, and that strife is in her heart as well. He, um, so she she just wants to be done with the with the uh, rivalry before it ever could blossom anymore. Um, you know her her bitterness in her own hearts between her and God. But um, what happens is is that Abraham understands that you know it should be his responsibility to take care of Hagar and Ishmael. He loves Ishmael. Ishmael is his firstborn. Concept. First shall be last. Last shall be first. This happens throughout Scripture, and Ishmael is not the first time it ha is not the first time it happens, and it's not the last time that it happens. It um, starts with the fall. The first humans fall into sin. The first become last. Um, Cain is the firstborn, and he becomes uh, subservient to Seth, the last. And uh, eventually we'll have first shall be last um, with uh, Jacob and Esau, 
on down the line. Uh, David's the last son. Um, so as we as uh, Judah makes himself humbles himself and becomes uh, a humble servant to Joseph, that um, who is one of the younger sons of of Israel, he he and Judah humbles himself before uh, Joseph as a and and as a replacement for Benjamin, who is the youngest. Um, and on it goes. But here, Ishmael is the firstborn, but he is not the son of promise. But God blesses him nonetheless. And, and um, while the children of Ishmael have turned ultimately into the enemies of Israel, sadly, that doesn't mean either A, that Ishmael himself uh, went apostate necessarily, him as a person any more than Esau did personally. Uh, but uh, even members of his nation, his descendants, are still able to be included through Christ. Uh, so the last can become the first can become last and once again become first. It's a pattern in scripture. So we have um, uh, we have Ishmael being dismissed. And why is that? It's not because we need to be um, harsh. Abraham's not just arbitrarily tossing them to the wind. Why does he turn turn them away the way he does? Because before he turns them away, God tells him that he's going to take care of, Abra of um, Hagar and, and um, Ishmael. God tells him. And this is one of the first times that we see Abraham having faith in the Lord to trust him. Again, the foolishness of, of God confounds the wise. Okay? The foolishness of God confounds the wise. So it's like it makes no sense for him to turn his um, essentially concubine and and his firstborn son into the wilderness. What could happen to them? He has to trust God, a direct command of God to do something that seems foolish, but it's God and his wisdom that is that is sanctioning this. He says, heed the voice of your wife and go ahead and let them go. I will take care of them. And Abraham has to choose here like he he has made the wrong choice in multiple times. He made the right choice in leaving uh, Ur of the Chaldees to begin with. But then he had to be uh, turned from his first stop to go into the land of promise. And then several times he's tried to go his own way. But here he is making a turn towards faith by trusting, by saying, Lord, I don't personally like it, but I trust you. And since you are directly telling me to do this, I will trust you to do, to do right in this situation. And he does. And then he who is first becomes last himself in the next uh, story in this chapter 21. He goes into uh, the um, uh, conversation with his neighbor, Abimelech, and I don't know if Abimelech is lying, but apparently Abimelech's men have seized his uh, Abraham's well, and it, it belongs to Abraham. It's Abraham's water, and Abraham's head saying, hey, what gives? What gives? And uh, um, Abimelech's like, well, I don't know what's going on. I, this is the first time I've heard about it. I, I don't know what's going on. And Abraham, rather than fighting and demanding uh, the return of his property or seizing the return of his property or going to war with Abimelech. He seeks peace with his neighbor by humbling himself and give, essentially paying for, some, for something that's already his. You see that? He gives him a whole bunch of livestock and says, here, let's just make this square. This is my well. You've been using it, whether by your knowledge or not. I'm going to buy what is mine own back from you. Sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? You see, even though we fell, Satan stole the heart of man when he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. And Christ had to give himself. He had to pay a price to buy what is essentially his own, his own creation after his own image. Abraham is starting to get it. 
you can see why Paul in his magnum opus, the book of Romans, um, uses Abraham as such an example of faith. Abraham is starting to get it here. Um, specifically in Nehemiah 10, um, the people, while this evolves into pharisaical um, works-based faith um, in the first century, by the time it rolls around, it wasn't the initial intention of Nehemiah, Ezra, and company to turn into works-based uh, self-aggrandizement. Their initial their initial thought was humility in order to uh, avoid um, transgressing against their Lord again and being judged again. So what do they do here in chapter 10? Well, last chapter, chapter 9, they read the book of the law. They went to the scripture and here, after reading the scripture, their hearts are convicted and they're saying, we are going to give our first worship to the Lord not that they're going to worship other gods, but we are going to give the first of our time uh, and, uh, and worship as He commands, and we are going to give the first of all of our possession to Him. Again, concept of first fruits. And I'm not saying that we need to see uh, giving to the church or giving to missionaries or, or charity as some sort of uh, investment scheme where, well, God says if I give here, He's going to double my investment so that's I'm just gonna give all of my money to charity uh, and to get more um, that should not be our motivation our motivation needs to be number one to honor God and number two to bless um, people with the gospel and those who are downtrodden however however when we think about either the giving of our time of our money of our resources um, what have you, a cup of cold water, uh, blessing uh, people, our gift of our encouragement to those who are, are presenting the gospel, having them for a meal, you name it. Our gifts, by humbling ourselves to give the first of our heart, the first of everything we have, it may seem like a sacrifice now, but if we give our first to the Lord, it'll seem like it's nothing from the blessing that we will receive. And that doesn't mean he'll give us money for money. Our blessing may completely transcend all monetary gain. Indeed, it will in the, uh, in the eternity that he has planned for us. So again, our first fruits will seem like an afterthought. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The, the glory that we have and the blessing that we will enjoy as a result of giving our best, giving ourselves to the Lord for His service, trusting in Him. It's, it, it's beyond compare to anything that we could ever imagine. Um, and he also, they mentioned the Aaronic priesthood, um, Aaron, the Levite tribe. Um, Moses and Aaron led the people of Israel, but they were to lead as servants. They lost uh, a portion of land in, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel because they were given the service of the temple and the service of worship. First shall be last, last shall be first. Theme throughout all of Scripture. And also, in the book of Acts, we'll, we'll find here Jesus, uh, um, well, Jesus does speak at the end of the, uh, Acts 20, but um, Paul is on his way home uh, to Israel, going back to see, um, to see what new adventure he has awaiting eventually in Rome. Um, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem, and he stops at Miletus, and he calls the Ephesian elders of the church of Ephesus to meet him in Miletus. Now, <laughs> most recently in Ephesus, he just got barked down by a mob of who was screaming at him for two hours, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. And um, Paul, 
<laughs> Paul doesn't want to go through that again, I guess. But he calls the Ephesian elders and blesses them and says, you'll not see me anymore after this in Miletus. And as he's there in Miletus, he, um, he blesses them, he communes with them, and they have a very uh, bittersweet parting. But it's something that um, he says here, the Lord Je he quotes the Lord Jesus in verse 35. He says, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. First, last, last, first. It doesn't seem in the wisdom of the world, or it seems foolish that giving is better than receiving. You would think that getting something would add to, you, add to your blessing, but indeed it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Uh, that's, that's an extremely uh, Christian, Christ-centered um, ethic. And furthermore, even with Ephesus, first, last, last, first, Ephesus was uh, established as a mighty church in the first century. It, um, we certainly know that it not only went under the tutelage of the Apostle Paul, it was under also uh, the church of Ephesus was eventually pastored by none other than the, the Apostle John himself. And what happens is that, uh, well, as John is told by Jesus, if they don't come back to their first love, that Ephesus church will uh, have their candlestick removed. And guess what? Ephesus is a ruin today. You can walk the streets of Ephesus, but uh, and there's some, the library's facade is, is built back up, but it's a ruin. First, last, last, first. Let's be sure, especially if we have successful ministries, especially if we experience great gain for the kingdom or even great prosperity in our own life and family. Let's be sure that <clears throat> we humble ourselves before the Lord and give up our best to the Master. And if you don't know Him, the best you can give Him right now is to give Him your own very existence and let Him give of His best to you by receiving Him and His shed blood and His life as a perfect sacrifice um, given in your place uh, to bear your punishment and to give of His resurrection to you. Accept that gift of Jesus Christ for your salvation before it is too late. We love you. Have a good day. Sorry, this one's 32 minutes long, but um, hope it's a blessing to you. God bless you.